Thank you very much, uh, Karisha, and good morning, everyone. And thank you to the conference organizing committee for having the issue of HIV AIDS in Eastern Europe and Central Asia on the agenda of the conference. My first slide summarizes or lists the points that I would like to make in this presentation. In contrast to what's happening globally, Eastern Europe and Central Asia sees an expanding HIV epidemic, actually growing at relatively fast rates. The epidemic has been and continues to be largely driven by unsafe injection drug use. However, in the last three to five years, heterosexual transmission has now also become a major component of epidemic growth. Access to antiretroviral treatment in the region remains low, particularly for key affected populations. HIV prevention is not accessible at sufficient scale. Access to harm reduction is either inexistent or very limited. Health systems are vertical and provider-centered. There are high levels of stigma and discrimination and numerous structural, cultural, societal and political obstacles to the AIDS response. Low levels of cooperation between government and non-governmental sector and significant issues around financial sustainability of the programs. This slide shows the dynamics of the epidemic in the region. As you can see in green, the increasing number of newly diagnosed HIV infections in, east, in the eastern region of the WHO Europe region, which means basically Eastern Europe and Central Asia, that contrasts with the stable epidemic we have in Western Europe in blue and the low-level stable epidemic in Central Europe in red. So whereas in the last nine years, 2005 to 2014, globally, new infections have decreased by 24% and AIDS-related deaths have decreased by 41% in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, newly diagnosed HIV infections have increased by 51% and AIDS-related deaths have increased by 21%. Now, talking about the region is really talking about two countries because most people living with HIV in the region are either in the Russian Federation, 143 million inhabitants, or Ukraine, 40th population, 43 million. The two countries account for 90% of new infections in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and what you can see here in red is the increasing curve of cumulative HIV cases uh, in the Russian Federation in between 1987 and 2013. And please note that the epidemic in Russia and in the region is a late epidemic as compared to what we have seen in other parts of the world. There's one country, by the way, missing on all my slides, which is Uzbekistan, that does not report and that may be a country of concern because it's the most populous country of Central Asia with close to 40 million uh, population. This slide shows in red that um, transmission through unsafe injection drug use remains uh, high, about 50% of all new cases of HIV are still linked to um, unsafe drug injection. That has been true for the last five years, as you can see. You also see in blue the rapidly increasing curve of transmission cases that are attributed or reported as being heterosexual. And in green, uh, the green data is mostly uh, data from the Russian Federation, uh, cases that are undetermined or yet to be determined when it comes to the route of transmission. The message here is that there are, there's most likely hidden epidemics here, particularly among MSM. To the right, you can see the purple curve showing a rapid increase in reported cases among MSM. However, if you look at the absolute numbers on the ordinate, it's clear that this is highly underestimated. In light blue to the right, the uh, relatively and the encouraging results when it comes to mother-to-child transmission that has been kept at relatively low levels in the region and that tends to decrease. 
Now, these are mostly concentrated epidemics, as I said, and the key populations at high risk in the region are people who inject drugs, sexual partners of people who inject drugs, men having sex with men, sex workers, incarcerated people across the region have higher rates, higher prevalence of HIV than the general population. Migrants. Um, in Armenia, where I was recently, 65% of all cases diagnosed in the last three years have been diagnosed among people who have been migrant workers in the Russian Federation. And if you add to that their sexual partners, this adds up to 76%. Uh, every year, millions of people are migrating from Central Asia and from the Caucasus to the Russian Federation, also to Kazakhstan, as this is a key um, economic uh, source of economic income for countries in the south of the region. Um, as I said earlier, these concentrated epidemics are now coexisting with an independent heterosexual epidemic unlinked to these risk groups, and there's good evidence for that, at least in the Russian Federation. Now, what these uh, key populations have in common is that they're either illegal, sex work is illegal in most countries in the region, or target of discriminatory, uh, discriminatory legislation and policies. There's high level of stigma and discrimination. There are major issues with data collection. There's no sentinel surveillance, and, of, and obviously uh, there are hidden epidemics that are highly probable, for example, among men having sex with men. Also, all of these populations, people who inject drugs, sex workers, MSM, have disproportionately low access to prevention and treatment services, and there's a strong distrust among these populations of government agencies. This slide shows the uh, slow, uh, much too slow, uptake of treatment in the region in purple. What you can see is that the overall coverage with treatment is below 30%. And you can also see that this purple curve is growing less faster than the blue curve, which is that of the cumulative uh, HIV infections, which means that not only is coverage low, but actually the gap between the increase in new infections and coverage with treatment is increasing. This is a treatment uh, cascade from Russia, the latest uh, data kindly provided by the Federal Aid Center in, in Moscow. And as you can see, there is a first major drop in between the esti people estimated uh, to be infected with HIV and the people uh, that have been diagnosed. It's a 44%, let's say close to 50% of people estimated to be infected with HIV wouldn't know their status. There is a drop in between HIV diagnosed and retained in care, but then a major drop again in treatment. So at the end, uh, you can see it's only about one third or less than one third of the people returned, retained on treatment that are um, retained in care that are on treatment. However, for those on treatment, if you look to the right, um, they're doing well and most of them are virally suppressed. Um, this is the same type of slide now at the regional level. The slide was put together by the network of people living with HIV uh, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So the numbers, the absolute numbers you see on the slide uh, are slightly different from those of WHO and UNAIDS. But when it comes to the percent and the cascade, I think it makes no difference. 47%, let's say 50% of people living with HIV wouldn't know their status. Uh, and of the uh, people who know their status, uh, only 25% or so are actually on treatment. So overall, it's only 15% of the estimated total number of people living with HIV in the region that accesses treatment. I'd like to focus now on people who inject drugs uh, because they've been a major factor in driving the epidemic in the region and also because um, they are, there is so much lost opportunities there and so much unnecessary deaths and, uh, and suffering uh, occurring. Uh, 
There's an estimated 3.5 million people who inject drugs in the region, 25% of whom are infected with HIV with large variations between countries. Two-thirds of people who inject drugs in the region are infected with HCV with a prevalence of HCV RNA estimated to be 45% so that co-infections rates are very high, often ranging between 70 and 90 percent among HIV-positive people who are also infected with HCV. And, and that may not be emphasized enough, uh, HIV-positive people who inject drugs have a two to six-fold higher risk of contracting TB as compared to the general population. And as you know, almost all countries in the region are high burdens high burden countries for MDR-TB. Actually, if you are a person who inject drugs and if you are incarcerated uh, in the region, your risk of acquiring TB is 25-fold that in the general population. This slide shows a study that um, indicates that for a person that is HIV positive, the highest risk in the region for acquiring MDR-TB is actually to be a person who injects drugs. There are many reasons why the epidemic is growing so fast among people who inject drugs. Uh, drug policies are wrong. A punitive approach to drug use is predominant. Uh, an oppressive approach to drug policies. And as you know, and as well documented in the scientific literature, fear of violence from police is associated with lower capacity for HIV risk reduction. There is a lack of appropriate social and health services for people who inject drugs, harm reduction not accessible, or if accessible, certainly not at the right scale. There are high levels of stigmatization and marginalizations. Vert system, health systems are vertical so that patients who are co-infected, let's say with HIV and TB, or patients who would be HIV positive and would be on OST, would seek treatment from different providers in different clinics that are often distant uh, geographically with actually differing treatment eligibility requirements. And then there's low access to treatment in Ukraine, for example, which is one of the countries that have been particularly um, successful in scaling up access to prevention and treatment in people who inject drugs. People who inject drugs only make 12% of people on ART. This slide shows the estimated annual number of syringes to the left distributed per person who inject drugs, in, and to the right the estimate number of the proportion of people um, um, accessing opioid substitution therapy. And you can see that, the, um, particularly looking at the upper part of the graph, most countries in the region are countries where people have like less than 20 or less than 40 access, less, less than 20 or 40 syringes per year. And when it comes to OST, it is less uh, than 10% access to OST in most countries in the region, and of course that is zero in the Russian Federation and Uzbekistan, two countries where uh, methadone is illegal. And that, despite the fact that the scientific evidence for the effectiveness of harm reduction interventions is comprehensive, um, compelling, and to me irrefutable, um, you've heard already many times in this meeting that needle exchange programs and opioid substitute therapy reduce the sharing of injection equipment and therefore avert HIV infections. In combination, the three together, ART, NSP, and OST, have been repeatedly shown to reduce HIV transmission, to decrease mortality, to promote initiation and com of in compliance with ART, to reduce drug dependency, to reduce crime and public disorder, and to be highly cost effective. And yet, um, and, and, and let me show you here a remarkable modeling work that Peter Vickerman has undertaken, uh, where he's shown that if you were, for example, to reduce HIV prevalence incidents, let's say, uh, by, by half over 10 years in St. Petersburg, and if you only had NSP, 
you would have to have all of these people covered for 80% during 10 years in a continuous fashion. However, if you were to use a paired intervention of NSP with ART or NSP with OST, you would, a 30 to 40% coverage would be sufficient. And if you were to use the three interventions that are synergistic, synergistics in between them, a 20% coverage of all three interventions would be sufficient, which I think is a reasonable target that should be able to be achieved. However, uh, for reasons that I really do not understand, I, I know of no area of medical science where the distance between what the science tells us that we should do and what is happening policy-wise is so great. So I call it here the predominance of policy-biased evidence over evidence-based policy. Prisons. A few words on prisons because people who inject drugs are so often incarcerated. The Russian Federation and many countries uh, in the region have some of the world's highest incarceration rates. Many prisoners wait for months in pretrial detention. There's overcrowding, poor physical conditions, poorly trained and often corrupt prison staff. There's high prevalence of TB and MDR-TB in prisons. And there is unsafe injection, drug use and unsafe sex. This uh, slide shows you the high proportion among people who are incarcerated for drug offenses in the region the high proportion of people who are incarcerated for just drug possession without intent to supply. And you can see that this goes from 20% in Uzbekistan to 72% here in Russia, 67% in Ukraine, 61% in Kyrgyzstan, very high numbers. Um, and this slide uh, comes from a work published last year showing that people who inject drugs when they are um, incarcerated in Ukraine, this is on a relatively small sample of, of people, but I think that the slide tells a lot. If you just focus on the red bar, 56% of them would continue injecting while in prison. And to the right, red bar, 74% of them would continue sharing needle and syringes with a mean number of sharing partners of four uh, point something over in between four and five. We know how much when it comes to concentrated epidemics and vulnerable people, the civil society and community organizations are important in shaping the AIDS response. Uh, in the Eastern European and Central Asian region, there are remarkable ex examples of strongly engaged individuals and activists. However, there are only very few structured and recognized civil society and community-based organizations uh, of the type we see in other parts of the world. In addition, in the last two to three years, as I'm sure you've heard, there's been restrictions on funding these organizations from international sources with what's called in Russia and Kyrgyzstan now the foreign agent law or foreign grant registration asking you to register as a foreign agent, quote, if you are to receive funds from international sources. And throughout the region, in, in all countries of the region, there's actually no administrative mechanism that would allow to contractually engage the non-government sector into an effective and meaningful partnership to extend the possibilities of the health system uh, with, with, with the government. And yet, NGOs and the civil society sector does absolutely remarkable work. This is a slide from the Alliance Ukraine. Uh, if you look at the upper left corner, you see that the Alliance, with funding from the Global Fund, has been able to reach last year 63% of the 300,000 people who inject drugs in Ukraine with uh, peer outreach, condom syringe distribution and information, and 46% of the estimated 80,000 
uh, sex workers, they've been distributing 14.5 uh, million condoms and 20.5 million syringes just in one year. The funding of these organizations and the funding of the work overall in, uh, when it comes to key uh, affected populations is really coming from international sources. As you can see here in blue, 80 percent of the funding for work with PWIDs and over 90 percent of the funding for work with sex workers and MSM comes from international sources and that funding is at very, very high risk. Um, the Global Fund is significantly, has already significantly reduced its investment in the region, which I really disagree with, and it intends to further decrease its investments, just because um, that region doesn't fit in what you've heard is the current mainstream model of thinking, where should the money of international aids uh, go. Uh, so these countries that are actually in the midst of major economic trouble, uh, these transitioning countries have now to transition from donor to domestic funding, which they're not ready to do. So the transition is slow. It's very far from self-sustaining. As you know, governments in the region have a very a limited, let's call it, willingness to pay for programs aimed at vulnerable groups. For example, less than 2% of national AIDS funding would go to PWID in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Moldova, Russia, Ukraine, and Uzbekistan. And these are regions that also, for various reasons that I can't have time to go into, procure medicines at much higher prices than most other countries with similar income levels. And we already know from experience that transition to state funding from global fund funding carries high risks of procurement disruptions. Finally, this is also a region where politics strongly influence uh, policies and what is ultimately happening on the ground. Uh, drug policies, as I said earlier, are heavily relying on prohibition law enforcement. Uh, and that hampers access to OST and NSP. Methadone is illegal in the Russian Federation, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. There are high rates of incarceration for drug offenses in most countries in the region. There's low, very low proportion of national HIV budgets devoted to prevention and to vulnerable groups. There is anti-LGBT legislation that is either being proposed or introduced throughout the region, certainly in Russia, in Kyrgyzstan. There is, uh, as you may know, uh, OST, uh, a program was running for over 800 people, was abruptly discontinued in Crimea within four weeks after annexation. And now today we're facing a major crisis in the uh, so-called non-government controlled areas of the Donbass. The Donbass is the region of Ukraine that had always had the highest prevalence and incidence of HIV, NTB, MDR, TB, and OST has been discontinued now there since May because of the conflict, but also because, I must say, government restrictions on the delivery of humanitarian aid to the conflict areas. This is also a region that is rapidly changing from a geopolitical perspective and I think we have to keep this in mind as I think that the response to AIDS is no more global but it is now multipolar and more and more regional just as our geopolitical globalized world has become multipolar. Uh, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova have signed association agreements with the EU and are going in one particular direction, um, although this is a tough itinerary for them. Ukraine is confronted, as everyone would know, with major economic challenges and conflict. Uh, the money is being devaluated every two weeks. There are complex geopolitics in Central Asia and in the Caucasus. Countries there have tight linked with the Russian Federation, but they also look very much to China, to Europe, to Turkey. Um, Russia, the Russian Federation, Belarus, uh, 
Kazakhstan, uh, Armenia, and Kyrgyzstan have now entered a free trade Eurasian economic space that is probably to evolve into a space where, quote, social policies will be harmonized, which I think can be a threat to harm reduction. And there is obviously a strong influence of the Russian Federation in the region, both positive and negative. So I've been thinking a lot about what it is that I should say about, so from there, where do we go from there? And I actually found no better way of expressing this than taking the first three recommendations of the recently released UNAIDS Lancet Commission that say, get serious about HIV prevention and continue the expansion of access to treatment while also working to address structural determinants of health that put people at risk, forge new paths to uphold human rights and address criminalization, stigma, and discrimination, change laws, policies, and public attitudes that violate human rights, urgently ramp up and fully fund AIDS efforts efficiently, and emphasize sustainability. Now, it's one thing to say what needs to be done, but actually taking these steps can feel like a tremendously challenging task in the face of all the barriers that I have been discussing. I strongly believe that we should not lose heart. We must maintain our faith in the people in the region. We need to support the shining examples of committed health providers and affected communities that are working under very difficult condi conditions. Those, for example, who continue to serve MSM in spite of the anti-gay propaganda, those who support people in the conflict areas of the Donbass and support and nurture them as much as we can. We must also learn from what has already been achieved in Moldova, a world-class harm reduction program in prisons, a comprehensive and nationally funded strategy in Belarus that is helping to sustain low prevalence rate the work of the Ukrainian NGO networks with people who inject drugs that I mentioned earlier, the harm reduction training for police in Kyrgyzstan, the mobile clinics for migrants in Armenia. So much of the data I have presented may be somehow discouraging, but I believe that building on successes such as these and continues, continuing to harness the courage of the people we should have continued hope and recommit ourselves to overcoming the epidemic in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Thank you for your attention.